put it here. Uh, like we've done in the past, I'm sure that more people are going to be joining us soon, and that's totally fine. We'll kind of get started slowly, uh, but then we'll get into everything and start talking a little bit more about how you can differentiate and personalize instruction in Canvas. So just like we've done with all of our other sessions, I'm going to start by simply sharing our agenda, uh, and we'll work through that first before we get into the content today. So a link to the agenda is now in the chat. You can open that up if you'd like. I'm also going to share my screen, though, so you should be able to see it that way, too. Uh, but you can see that today we are on session six, and this is our last session together, at least in this series. Uh, but the important thing for today is that we are going to talk mostly about how to personalize learning inside of Canvas. This is one of the things that I'm most excited about because um, I think Canvas Canvas is helpful, and I think it's a really good way to organize content for students. And at least for me as a teacher, it made my job a little bit easier. So I love it for all of those reasons. But the thing that I think is really powerful about Canvas is it does give you a lot of tools to individualize content and learning for your students. And the that, to me, extended my abilities as a teacher beyond any other tool that I might be using. So we're gonna look at that in a little bit more depth today. And the way that we're going to do that is first off, uh, we're going to talk just briefly about differentiation and personalization. Uh, after we do that, we're going to talk about utilizing module requirements and prerequisites. This is something that we actually talked about in an earlier session when we talked about organizing content around modules. So today I'm just going to touch on that briefly. I'm going to remind you of that. And then we'll use that as a segue to talk about mastery paths. And we'll, we'll actually spend most of our time today talking about mastery paths and how to create those in Canvas. But then after we've done that, the last thing we'll look at is how you can use different gradebook settings and filters to help you identify students who need more support really quickly uh, and hopefully be able to target certain skills that students need to work on. So that is our plan for today. Before we get into too much else, though, are there any big questions that I can answer first? All right, cool. Let's get into it then. So I am going to go ahead and go to Canvas. If you want to follow along, you are more than welcome to. So if you have a course that you've been working in or a course that is maybe a sandbox course that you can mess around in, uh, feel free to go there if you'd like. If you want to just watch and listen, that works too. Whatever works best for you. But I'm in Canvas for Right now, you can see these are all of my courses. I'm going to go into the sandbox course for the time being today. Uh, and in that sandbox course, I have a couple of modules set as my homepage. Now, we've talked about this before. Most homepages will have maybe a picture, course content, things like that. For today, though, I've set the modules as the homepage because we'll be spending most of our time in modules today. Now, at the top, you'll see that we have unit one. And then below that, I have a couple of example modules. We are going to look at the example modules in just a minute. So we'll come back to those. But for right now, we're going to focus on this unit one module. And again, this is a module that we've kind of played with in previous sessions, so it may seem familiar to you. But I've gone ahead and removed a lot of things from this module so that it's really short and simple, and it only has these two elements in it. Now, like I mentioned before, I want to start by just talking about about uh, prerequisites and requirements inside of your module options. Now, I want to distinguish between those first, and then I'll show you how you can use them. So first point is requirements in a module. For any module that you build in Canvas, you have the ability to tell Canvas that students need to complete all of the items in the list. Maybe they need to move through them sequentially. Maybe they need to get a certain score on an assignment before they can move on. You can set all of those settings yourself, and you can tell Canvas how to set those. Those are what Canvas calls requirements for your module. Prerequisites, on the other hand, though, apply to multiple modules. And what I mean by that is once I open up this module and look at its settings, you'll notice that I don't have the ability to add any prerequisites to this module. And that's because it's the first module in my list. Prerequisites simply apply to the module that came before whatever one you're working on. Another way to look at this. I could set a prerequisite for this example module right here that says that students need to complete all of 
the things in unit one's module before this module will open up for them. So that's what I mean by a prerequisite. Now, all of that said, I'm going to go into my module settings. So I have unit one right here. If I go all the way over to the side, click on those three dots, I'm then going to click on edit. That's going to bring up a bar on the side where I can start adding in some of those requirements. Now you'll see that I have this plus requirement button and then I have some options. My top option is I can require students to complete everything that is in the module or I can also say that students simply need to complete one of the things that's in the module. Typically, most teachers have their courses set up so that they want students to complete all of those options. So we'll start there. And you can see once I've toggled that on, I also get this other box right here that says students must move through requirements in sequential order. Now that just says that before students can move on to the second thing, they have to complete the first thing first. Now I'm gonna leave that off for today because what I really wanna focus on is down here. And you'll see this is where my requirements start to populate. So one of the things that's in my module is adult ed demo assignment one. You can see that's the first item in my module right here. That's going to populate as soon as I click on complete all because Canvas is going to start putting in some requirements for me to adjust. Now, as it stands right now, as long as students open that up and look at it, that will count in Canvas's mind as having completed it and they can move on to the next thing. I don't necessarily want that as a teacher all the time though. I probably want my students to turn in the assignment before they move on, right? And so I could click on this drop down menu and say, do I want them to simply view it? Do I want them to mark it as done? That will make a little checkbox appear next to it and students can check it off. Do I want them to have to submit the assignment or do I want them to have to score at least X out of 10. Now for this one, I'm just going to say submit the assignment. As long as they turn it in, then that will unlock the next thing for them. The next thing is this group assignment. And I wanna set a requirement for that too. So I'm going to click plus requirement again, and you can see that it's going to pull up my group assignment right here in this drop down menu. And for my group assignment, I want to say that students need to score at least 12 out of 15 before they can move on. And in this case, move on would mean move on to the next module. Now, as soon as I save those, you'll see that in my module, and I'll just hit relock or continue since there aren't any active students in here. It doesn't matter too much, but basically what this means is continue just says, you know what, wherever students are, these settings that I've just established will apply from now on. Whereas if I said relock, that means, you know what, if students are halfway through, these requirements still apply to them. I want to like kind of refresh the module. They have to go through all these requirements too. For right now, I'm just going to hit continue though. And you'll see that across the top, I now have this box that says complete all items. And that shows me that I've added some requirements to the module. Now, like I mentioned before, I can't add any prerequisites to this module because it's the first module in the list. So I'm actually going to go ahead and edit this example module that's right here. So I'll click on the three dots, hit edit. Once I've done that, you'll see that I have that same bar that appears on the right hand side. I've already set requirements for this module and we'll talk more about those requirements later, but I could scroll through those and adjust those requirements if I wanted to. But right now, the important thing that I wanna focus on is this prerequisites option right here. And it looks exactly the same as the requirements option did just a moment ago, but I'll go ahead and select that. And then I get a drop down menu that allows me to select which modules I want to be prerequisites for this module. Now, because there's only one module ahead of this module, I only have one option in my drop-down menu. However, if I was editing this bottom module, in that case, I would have two items in my uh, prerequisite item or my prerequisite list, excuse me. And so I could select that as needed and then hit save once I'm ready for that. I'm just gonna hit cancel for the time being, but I am going to go into this last one just to show you the difference. So I'll go in, hit edit. You see, I have my prerequisite option. I can click plus and I could select unit one as a prerequisite, but now because there's more modules ahead of it, I also still have that plus prerequisite option and I can add in the other module too, if I wanted to. So I could say, not only do students have to complete this, but they also have to complete this before they can move on to this. And that can force students to move 
through all of your modules sequentially. One other way that I've seen teachers do this, and this is pretty common, is um, you might have some sort of module at the beginning of your course that has some sort of foundational information that students need to pass off in some way before they can get into the like quote unquote actual course content. So for instance, in a shop class, I've seen the teacher set their first module as like their safety module. And then that module is a prerequisite for everything else. So they can't start working on all the other assignments until they've completed the safety module. However, that's the only prerequisite for the other one. So as long as you've done the safety module, then you can move through the other ones in whatever order you want. So you can set it up that way, or you can force them to move through sequentially by adding multiple prerequisites to each module. Now, hopefully that gave you a really quick overview of the requirements and prerequisite settings in modules. And I want to pause here for just a minute to create space for questions before we start digging into mastery paths. So what questions can I respond to as far as what you just saw? All right, onwards and upwards then. If you think of any questions, please feel free to interject. Please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, I'll do my best to respond to those as they come up, but just know that you're more than welcome to uh, give me a question whenever one comes to mind. All right, so at this point, we have done our welcome back thing. We skipped over UEN resources today, uh, and we dove right into utilizing module requirements and prerequisites. At this point, though, I want to turn back to this idea of differentiation and personalization, just so that we're all using the same language today to talk about things. Um, I don't know if this is an official distinction, so bear with me. If you have a different framework for looking at things, that's totally fine. I'm not trying to convince you that you're wrong or anything like that. All I want to let you know is that today I'm going to use differentiation to mean something a little bit different than personalization. Here's how I'm going to distinguish those. Differentiation, at least for me right now in the time being, is going to mean that I am giving students different content based on their performance or based on their needs. In other words, maybe I have a student who scores two out of 10 on a quiz, and so they get some sort of review assignments that maybe other students don't get. That's more of what I mean by differentiation when I say differentiation today. Uh, on the other hand, when I say personalization, I'm mostly going to be referring to the act of letting students choose some of their content and kind of de determine their own learning pathways. So for instance, um, if I was teaching an English class and I had two books that students could choose between, I might say something like, if you want to read X, Y, and and Z book, you're going to be over here. If you want to read A, B, and C book, you're going to be over here. That isn't based on how the students are performing. It's not based on achievement data. It's based on their choice. And so I'm going to use the word personalization today. And I know that I'm kind of splitting hairs. I know that there's a lot of overlap, but I just wanted to clarify some of that language today so that we could talk about both of those different options because teachers do both of those different things. All of that said, I want to get into Mastery Paths. And what Mastery Paths is, is it is a feature in Canvas that allows you to customize the content that different students receive based on, on a choice or based on how they perform on some sort of pre-assessment. And you can kind of see where this is going because I could use it for differentiation or I can use it for personalization. Now, I feel like the easiest way to talk about Mastery Paths is to show you an example, talk through the example, show you how to build it, and then return back to the example. So we're going to kind of move through that uh, pattern today. Now, all of that said, let's start with the example. This is the example that we're going to look at first. So you can see it's Nearpod infused mastery paths. I'm going to open this up, and you'll see a module just like you might be used to. And this module has a pre-assessment, and then it has a list of assignments. You'll notice that those assignments at the very beginning have group names. So the first two correspond with the quote-unquote Zion group. Next one's the Bryce group, Arches group. And we'll look at what those groups are in just a moment, but I just wanted to point out that they are grouped a little bit. You'll also probably notice that we have all of this content on the side of my module as well. 
And that is telling me as the instruction instructor how my mastery paths is functioning. So if I open up this original module, you'll notice that I don't have any of that content because I don't have mastery paths in that module. But in this example, you can see that's all set up. Now, what mastery paths are is Canvas is going to allow me as the teacher to create some sort of pre-assessment. It can be a quiz, it can be an assignment, but it has to be something that's graded. After I have created that, then I can tell Canvas if students score between three and four or eight and eight and 10, whatever the case may be, if they score in this bracket, I want them to receive these things. Or if they score in this bracket, I want them to receive these things over here. Or if they score in this bracket, I want them to receive these things over here. So let's look at that in a little bit more depth in Canvas. Now, you can see that I have my pre-assessment right here. This is what's going to launch everyone into their mastery paths. You'll also notice that that pre-assessment is scored out of four potential points. That's going to be important in just a moment. Now, if I wanna see how all those pathways are working, I need to click on this mastery paths link right here that's attached to that assignment. Because this assignment is what's triggering the mastery paths, it's always going to get this link right next to it. So I'm going to click on that link and this is going to provide me a summary of what I have in my different learning pathways. So you'll notice that if students score between 2.8 and 4 on this pre-assessment, they're going to get these assignments. If they get between 1.6 and 2.8, they're going to get these assignments. And if they get between 0 and 1.6, they're going to get these assignments here. Now, the only reason that these assignments have a group name at the beginning is simply so that it would help me as the instructor keep track of them. Because if I have a lot of assignments in my mastery paths, it can get kind of convoluted and a little bit crazy if I don't label them in some way. So that's more for me than as the teacher than as the student. The reason why is because let's say as a student, I score 3.5. So I'm in this section right here. If I return back to my module, if I was the student who scored 3.5, I would only see these things in my module. These things would not appear at all. They wouldn't appear anywhere in Canvas for me. So the reason I bring that up is because this label, they're gonna see it, but it's not like they have to choose the things that are in the Zion group or the Bryce group. They're just going to get whatever applies to them. What questions can I answer at this point? I know that that was kind of a convoluted overview, but hopefully I gave you an idea of what we're looking at. What can I respond to here? All right, let's go into a little bit more depth then on how to set this up and how to make it function really well. So I'm going to go back to my unit one module. Again, this one doesn't have any mastery paths set up yet, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and start building those. So let's say that this adult ed demo assignment one is my pre-assessment. It's what I want to use to determine which pathways students get. Again, remember that your pre-assessment can be a quiz or an assignment. This is an assignment, we'll use that. Excuse me. Now, after I've built that and after I've added it to my module, at that point, I can then initiate mastery paths from it. But it's really important to note here that I have to build the pre-assessment first and I have to add it to the module first. Those things have to happen. Now, those have already happened here. So now once that's done, I can go ahead and open up the rest of the settings for that assignment. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to come over here to these three dots. And in that menu, you'll see that one of my options is mastery paths right here. Now, I want to pause for just a second because I, uh, <laughs> I talk to people about mastery paths a lot. And sometimes, depending on how your Canvas course is set up, you may not see mastery paths appear in this menu here. So 
if you are in Canvas right now, or maybe you're checking Canvas later and you click on those three dots and you're like, Mass 3 Pass is not there, this man is a liar. Uh, just know that there's another little setting that needs to be adjusted. That setting is going to be found in your course settings. And I can give you more details for that if you need. So if you are running into an issue where you're like, I can't find the setting to turn on Mass 3 Pass, send me an email. I'm happy to send you more instructions for that. I just don't want to go into all of the details today because I'm assuming that most of you probably already have it, or maybe not. Okay, let's go into it then. <laughs> I'm seeing shaking heads. Let's find it. Okay, so what you're going to do is if you don't have that option up here, um, and again, you need to click on the assignment three dots to find it. Sounds like we don't have it. If that is you, then you're going to go to settings. In your settings, you are going to have a range of different options that you can do. Now, depending on how your Canvas instance is set up, this setting might be in a couple of different places. So bear with me, we might need to poke around a little bit. But the first place that I would recommend that you look is in feature options right up here. So go ahead and click on feature options. In feature options, one of those is typically going to be mastery paths. It's not always in here, but one of those could be mastery paths. I'll give you a second to look through and see if mastery paths is available to you in those feature options. If you find it, give me a yes. If you don't find it, give me a no. Okay. Is there, seeing... Because most of us have the same instance, we're working out the same instance. Is there something that needs to be done in the admin part to make sure that it's available for everyone? Um, potentially. Uh, usually the way it works is it's typically defaulting to an instructor level decision or an instructor level setting. However, the admin on your instance can definitely change the default to default to on for everyone, default to off for everyone, things like that. But typically the instructor does have a little bit of control. Um, okay, Jamie, thank you for the clarification. The great book is a little bit different, so we won't worry about that part. Uh, but let's go ahead and check somewhere else because there's somewhere else where this might be. Um, if you go to course details and we scroll, all the way down, right about in here. And I, I'm trying to think of where it might be in yours. Right about in here. So I'd look under the file storage. There may be a checkbox somewhere in here that says allow mastery paths. Take a second to see if you can find that checkbox. And again, it appears in different places for different people. Is it the one under format? I think I see it. One under format. Ah, good catch. Thank you. Yes. So you'll see mastery paths right here under format. And then mine is grayed out because my, and this goes back to what I was saying before, is the administrator for my instance has set that on and turned it on for everyone. So I don't even have the ability to turn that off as a teacher. Uh, but you should be able to check that. Thank you, Alex, for finding that. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Okay, so last thing I'll say is, once you've checked that box, just make sure you click on this Update Course Details button. That will save everything for you. So go ahead and click on Update Course Details, and then you should be back. Uh, Jamie, you do need to do this for every course that you're going to use Mastery Pass in. However, Alex, I will say that whoever the Canvas admin is, and I think that's maybe you, there's a setting somewhere. I don't know where on this one that allows you to turn that on by default for everyone. So that might be something to look into as well. Now, with all of that said, once that's set up, we can now go into the assignment, click on that little menu and go to mastery paths. 
Now, once I initiate mastery paths, I'm going to get something that looks like this. And this should be pretty familiar to the example that we just looked at a moment ago, where I can now type in the different thresholds for different learning pathways. Now, this initial assignment that I'm basing the mastery paths off of is only worth two points. So that makes this a little bit weird. But let's say that the bottom uh, category is going to be 0 to 0 0.5. And then the top is going to be um, between 0 0.5 and 1. We'll say that. Or excuse me, 0 0.5 to 1 for the middle and then 1 to 2 for the top. Now, once I've put in those thresholds and decided, okay, this is what it means to be in the high group, this is what it means to be in the middle group, so on and so forth, I have this plus button. And that works exactly as you might anticipate, where I can click on that. And then Canvas is going to pull up a list of all of the things that I have inside of my course. This includes assignments, it includes quizzes, it includes pages, all of the elements that I want, might want to add. Now, I can filter through those by saying, you know what, only show me the assignments, only show me the quizzes, or I can go ahead and search inside of there, or I could just scroll through if that's easy. But once I have figured out what I want to add, then I simply need to just check box whatever I want to add to that learning pathway and then click on add items. Canvas is going to drop those into that learning pathway. So you can see that now this learning pathway has these three things. And I can reshuffle those, a drag and drop, and move them around as needed. Additionally, though, I'm going to go in and add things to my other pathways. And I'm just selecting things at random right here. Uh, and I'll do that for the bottom one too. And Jamie, I see your question. Let me respond to that in just a minute. That's a really good one. All right. So now that I've added all of these assignments, you can see that I have a list of things for all of my students. And then once I'm ready, I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Now, I want to give you a couple of quick tips before you start diving into this. Tip number one. You may have noticed this, but you may have missed it. When I click on this plus button, Nowhere am I given the option to create something new. In other words, if something hasn't been created in your course, you can't add it to a mastery path by just generating it inside of the mastery path itself. What I mean by that is it is really helpful for you as a teacher if you think through what type of resources everyone is going to get for each bracket first, then create those resources and then go and add them to your pathway. Because you're not going to have an option in here that says like create new assignment or create new quiz. You're not gonna be able to initiate that from mastery paths. That's the first thing. The second thing that I wanna say is that you'll notice that there are three categories. For whatever reason, Canvas only ever gives you three categories. You get three. You can't have two, you can't have four, you can't have five, you can't have six, you get three. Um, I don't know why, uh, but that's how it currently exists. So a couple of things to help you work through that process. First off, there are many times where I've used mastery paths and simply made one uh, pathway exactly the same as the other pathway. So let's say I want two pathways. I might set a high group and a low group. My high group gets this thing. My medium group gets this thing, and my low group gets the exact same thing as the middle group because I only really want two groups. So that's one way to work around it. If you want more than three, things get a little bit more convoluted. However, Canvas does give you the ability to embed mastery paths within mastery paths. Uh, you can have mastery path inception if you want. So you can have one mastery path that has these items in it, and then let's say that I go back to my module, I can then initiate mastery paths off of this item and build pathways for that as well. So you still have this weird dynamic of you kind of still have to play uh, in multipliers of three. So you, again, would have three more pathways off of your item banks. However, that is one way to kind of finagle it and work around it. But like I said, that can get pretty complicated. So I would recommend, that you mostly work with two or three pathways, at least when you're getting started. I'm going to go ahead and hit save, though, uh, and that will kind of create our pathways for us. Now, at this point, Jamie, I want to return back to your question. So you 
who said we may need to add specific assignments for review before we do this, right? I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, it sounds like um, you're asking, do we need to create assignments first before we add them into the pathway? Is that right? Okay, good. I'm glad that I touched on that. Now, with that said, once you have created your pathway, you can see that I hit save and it took me back to my original assignment. Remember that this is the assignment that's triggering my mastery path. Because this is triggering my mastery path, you'll now see that I get a breakdown on the side of my assignment that shows me how many students have been assigned to each pathway. And then I can also click on the link and get a list of each student who is inside of each pathway. And that's how I, as the teacher, can kind of monitor which students ended up where. Because what's going to happen is they're going to turn in the assignment, I'm going to grade it, and Canvas is going to automatically push them into those different learning pathways. I'm gonna pause for just a moment here. What questions can I respond to? What can I help with here? Okay, I'm going to give you one last really important dynamic to this, and then we'll talk about how you might implement it, how you might implement it with a couple of tips and tricks is what I'll say. So we'll go back to the modules. Um, and again, this is the module that we've been working in, and you can see that now I have this mastery paths link right next to that assignment. And again, that's going to indicate that this assignment is triggering some sort of learning pathway for my students. The important thing that I wanna highlight here though, is that you saw me add all sorts of assignments to those various learning pathways. Those assignments do not automatically populate in your module. So once you've built those assignments and once you've built those pathways, your last step is you now need to come back into the module you need to click on your little plus button and you need to add all of those things into the module itself. Otherwise, they won't just show up there. Students still won't be able to access them until they've been added to the module. Once they've been added to the module though, Canvas is smart enough to figure out which student is on which pathway and it will automatically hide the other assignments from that student. So for instance, if we look at our complete example here, if I'm in the Zion group, all of these things are going to disappear from my module as soon as I complete the pre-assessment. Now, that's a really quick overview of how to set this up. Um, that said, there are a couple of ways to make this work for different contexts in your classroom. You may remember that before I started talking about Mastery Pass and stepping through all the dynamics and mechanics of how it works, I said that you can differentiate. So you can give students content based on performance and you can also personalize and you could give them comments or content based on choice. Now, I should have given myself a little bit of a caveat there because you can personalize, but you have to kind of game the system a little bit. Here's what I mean by this is I have frequently set up assignments, and maybe I'll do this right now. Let's, let's actually set it up together. So I'm going to work in this module. I'm gonna step back a second and work through the whole process with you. In this module, I'm going to create a new assignment. And let's say that this new assignment is going to trigger a new set of mastery paths. So I'll go to my plus button. I'll make sure that this is on assignment, and then I'll click on create assignment. And I'm going to call this essay choice. And I'm going to hit add item. Now that's in my module and I'll open that up and I'm going to add some details to it. And this is something that I would do in my own classroom when I was teaching language arts. Again, I was teaching at the high school level. So you're going to see an example that's a little bit more high school oriented, but the same principle applies to whatever you're teaching. So now once I've opened up my assignment, I might say something like, what type of essay do you want to write? Um, only select one, something like this. And then I might put in some bullet points. Oops, let's do this. Put in some bullet points uh, and give some options. Let's say argumentative, informative, and narrative, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then I'm going to have to set some sort of point total because I want it to be able to trigger mastery paths. And if the points are set to zero, it cannot trigger those. So I'm going to say that this is worth 
three points. Again, I can adjust all these other settings as needed, and we've talked about that in previous uh, sessions. Hopefully that's familiar to you. Um, but then I'm also going to check this box right here and say, do not count this assignment towards students' final grade. So they are going to get a score, but it's not going to be calculated into how they're graded at all. I'm also going to set my submission type to online, and I'll just say text entry here. And now what I can do, I'll hit Save and Publish. Now what I can do is, as the instructor, I'm going to tell my students, hey, I need you to complete this assignment. It's going to tell you that you are getting a score, but the score isn't going to be counted anywhere, I promise. And then all I'm going to do is, as the instructor, I'm going to keep some sort of guide that tells me how to score students' responses. So in other words, if they say they want to write a narrative, I'm going to give them one out of three. If they say they want to write an informative essay, I'm going to give them two out of three. And if they say they want to write an argumentative essay, I'm going to give them three out of three. And as soon as it, I have scored it that way, then Canvas will be able to push them into their mastery paths. And I can create a mastery path for my narrative students that has a bunch of narrative content in it. It has some narrative assignments. It has some narrative pages, so on and so forth. And I am kind of working around the system by giving them one out of three on their assignment and saying, oh, Canvas, if students get one out of three, they get this learning pathway. And it will push students into those. Now, of course, you're probably already thinking this. This sounds really good, but you're going to have to be really, really clear to students that this grade does not actually count. Now, Canvas helps you out a little bit because they put this little blue bar up here and students see this blue bar that says this assignment does not count toward the final grade. However, I have also worked with students and I know that some of them, not all of them, have a propensity to not read things very carefully. So uh, I would recommend that you really emphasize that to students. However, that is one way to personalize content in Canvas based on students' choices. And that can be a really good way to uh, support individualized projects and things like that. Because now what I can do is rather than just having a big assignment that says, turn in your essay, no matter what you wrote, just turn it in here. Now what I can do is I can create individual assignments for each of those essay types that have different rubrics that apply to that essay type. And before they even get to that assignment, maybe there's like four or five pages where they read about that essay type and learn how to write a narrative, so on and so forth. Maybe there are some practice assignments that are specific to that genre. Uh, and then in Canvas, I even have the ability to set up all those requirements too. And that's where I want to take you back to our example. So you can see that in this example, I have my pre-assessment and then each group gets two different assignments. But if I open up the requirements for this module, you'll notice that students have to complete all of the items and they have to move in sequential order. And then for some of the assignments, they have to score at least three out of four to move on. So again, going back to that earlier example, let's say that I scored 3.5 on this pre-assessment. I would only see these top two assignments, these two Zion group assignments. And I would have to complete this one before I can complete this one. But more than that, I would have to score at least three out of four on this one before this one even opens up for me. And so now as the teacher, I have a lot of control over students' individualized learning pathways, which was really empowering to me because when I first started trying to personalize and differentiate at a higher level in my classroom, I would say things like choose which essay type you want to write and then I'll check in with you. But there was no way for me to like, ensure that my students were moving through a learning pathway that was scaffolded and provided them practice and provided them with support. And then I was able to do that once I figured out how to use Mastery Paths. So that is my little soapbox on Mastery Paths. That's a quick rundown on how to set up differentiation and personalization. What questions can I answer at this point though? Because I know that I've been talking to you a lot and some of this got a little bit into the weeds. So what can I clarify? Braxton, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, so what if I have an assignment, like a quiz, and if they do well on it, I just want them to move on. Mm. Is that possible to do and not do any more review or redo or retake the quiz or something? 
Really good question. I'm going to um, answer that in two ways. The first way is I am fairly certain in your mastery pathways, I'm going to open this up. I'm fairly certain that you could just leave one of them blank. Uh, and I don't think that that will cause any problems. Let me test it. We'll see if Canvas gets mad. Yeah, OK. So I should be able to just leave it blank. And then nothing else will populate. So in the they module. do really well. They just move on to the next thing. But if they don't, then I can give them an alternative questions. So they're not just giving the same ones over and over. Exactly. And okay. one thing that I would say is even though you could set it up to just have nothing in it, um, one thing that I typically recommend with Mastery Paths is that you add in maybe a page, something really simple at the beginning to just explain what's going on to students. Because students, at least in my um in my context, had uh, they often would talk to each other and be like, I don't understand, like this kid got that, I got this, what is going on? Um, and so typically the first item in any of my mastery paths would be an item that said, hey, you did really well on this quiz, or hey, thanks for taking this quiz, I want you to review X, Y, and Z. And it would be a quick page like that. And with my students who did really well, and I did things similar to what you're describing here, I would just say, hey, congratulations on earning at least 80% on the quiz. You're good to go ahead and move on to the next module. Uh, and so I would typically add things like that in as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What other questions can I respond to? Okay, one other thing that came to mind as I was uh, talking through that with Jamie. The other thing is this, I would just recommend that you are mindful about the assignments that you are using to trigger a mastery pathway. And what I mean by that is students cannot move forward in the module. They don't even see anything in the module until they have completed that trigger assignment, which means, or excuse me, until that trigger assignment has been graded. Barring completion, it has to be graded in some way. And so what that means for you is if you are working with students, and forgive me, your context may be far different than this, so bear with me here. But as a point of example, um, let's say that on Monday I'm working with my students and I want them to write this writing assignment that I'm going to grade, and then that writing assignment is going to trigger different learning pathways that we are going to go down on Tuesday. That is fine and well. However, as a teacher, I am committing to grading all of those writing assignments prior to Tuesday. Because if I don't, then students are going to come in on Tuesday and they're not going to be able to do the next step because I haven't graded the thing. So just bear that in mind. I saw a teacher who created Mastery Paths and the trigger assignment was an essay that needed to be graded. And I felt an immense amount of fear for this person. So... Just be strategic about that. Um, like I said, it can be a quiz and quizzes in Canvas can auto grade. So that's a really good way to do it if you need to use the learning pathways really quickly. Or if you're like, it's not a big deal. We're gonna do this pre-assessment at the beginning of the month, but we're not really gonna get to that unit until November or something. In that case, it's not a big deal. Just create your assignment and set up the mastery paths, but just consider that as you're creating everything. Now, hopefully that gave you an overview of how you might implement Mastery Paths yourself. The last thing on our agenda, though, if we return back to that, is to just touch on the gradebook in Canvas and some of the settings and filters, excuse me, that might be most helpful to you. So I'm going to go back to my course, uh, and I'm going to open up my gradebook. All of these are just sample demo students. So don't be afraid, I'm not showing you people's grades. Uh, and really there's not, not much to see here anyways. But with that said, I'm going to step through some settings that first off might save you some time if you haven't already been using them. But then second off, beyond settings, I wanna talk about filters and how filters can be really powerful in helping you like identify student needs really quickly. So we're gonna start with settings. Settings are right over here in your gradebook. You have that little gear icon. Once you click on that, you get this bar that opens up on the right-hand side. Some of the settings that I've seen save teachers a lot of time 
are primarily right here where Canvas can automatically assign a grade to a student if they haven't submitted an assignment. So if I check this, I can set whatever percentage I want. Uh, typically, most teachers are going to set this to zero. Uh, but what this means is that if I have an assignment that's maybe my essay assignment that's due at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, and now it is 12.01 a.m. On, on Thursday, Canvas will say, oh, the student didn't turn in their assignment. They get a zero in the gradebook. Now, that zero is very easy to override. As soon as the student submits it and you grade it, Canvas will override that zero and put in their actual grade. However, that zero is a good flag to students that they're missing something and they need to turn something in. Uh, that can save you a lot of time if you're manually entering zeros. You don't need to do that. You also have an option too to automatically uh, deduct points for late submission. So if you have some sort of policy in your classroom that's like for every day that the assignment is late, I take off 5% off the top, whatever it is, uh, for every minute that it's late, you lose 50%, as the case may be. Uh, you can put all of those numbers in as needed, and you can adjust those. So again, those are just kind of some time-saving options. Um, grade posting probably doesn't matter too much right now, but we will talk about view options. Um, this just tells Canvas how you want all of the assignments arranged in your gradebook. By default, uh, I think that the default setting for Canvas as far as arrangement is just sheer anarchy. I haven't been able to figure out why they arrange things the way they do. I always click on this drop down and either change it to due date, oldest to newest, or module first to last. That seems like a logical way for me to organize them. However, you can see there are a variety of options. Um, you could also choose to show or not show unpublished assignments. Uh, and you have a couple of options here. One thing that's helpful though, is that Canvas is going to automatically color code your gradebook based on different parameters. So if an assignment is late, it's going to be blue. If it's missing, it's going to be red. And that's what you're seeing right over here in my gradebook. Just as, um, Kind of a fun point, I guess. You can customize that color. So you can hit edit and you can choose one of their colors or you can type in your own hexadecimal code and choose any color you want. Um, I once worked with a teacher who set all of these to various shades of pink uh, because that's how they wanted to live their life. I have not chosen that same pathway, but you certainly could. So those are basically some of your settings to help customize the gradebook for whatever you need. What's a little bit more interesting to me, at least, though, is the filter options, like I mentioned before. And filtering is going to allow you to search through your gradebook really, really quickly. Now, obviously, at the top, you can just search by student name. So I can type in my own name, and it's going to pull up me. I can also search by assignment. So I could say adult uh, demo assignment. And you can see that it's going to pull up that assignment and it's gonna pull it up for me. Uh, so you have those search features. But what became really useful to me was filtering because sometimes I wanted to see a bunch of students at once if they fit into a certain category. So here's what I mean by that. Once I click on filters, you can see that I have a bunch of options. I can see a certain section at once. So maybe I'm teaching this class multiple times. I could just look at one section if I wanted to. I could look at just one module at a time if I wanted to. Um, I can look at assignment groups. And we've talked about this before, but basically if you are dividing your gradebook into like 80% of your grades are made up by assessments and 20% are made up by assignments, you can filter by those groups that you've created. Um, you can filter by status, so show me all of the late assignments, show me all of the missing assignments. This missing one can be really helpful if we're trying to target students who have fallen behind and we want to help them catch up. We could say, show me all of the missing assignments, and then I could even filter by a specific student if I wanted to, and now it's just going to give me a list of all the students or all the assignments that that student is missing, so I'll put myself in here. I am missing these two assignments. So as a teacher, what I would quite frequently do is if students asked me for a list of missing assignments, I would just set it up like this. And then I would just take a screenshot real fast of that and send it to them. That way I don't have to type out a big long list of assignments because usually when 
students ask you that question, it's usually more than just one assignment. Um, so that's something that I frequently did. Uh, you can see that you could also filter by whether or not an assignment has ungraded submissions. I've seen teachers use this a lot where they're like, you know what, today I'm going to grade everything that hasn't been graded in my grade book. And you can get a big list of all those things all at once. Um, I don't know why this is helpful, but maybe it is to some people. If uh, something has been submitted, you can get a list of everything that has been submitted, so on and so forth. Uh, the one, or, and I'll touch on this one too, you can also set um, like a search parameter for show me any assignments between September 15th and November 1st or something like that. That can be really helpful if you are working, if you already have your Canvas course built and you already have the assignment set up and um, maybe a student comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to be out of town for two weeks. What am I going to miss? You could go to the filters and put in the dates that they're going to be gone, hit apply, and then you have a list of assignments. So that can be useful in that way. But the one that really excites me and the one that I think is re really powerful is the student groups one. And we've talked about student groups in previous sessions, but just as a quick reminder, if you forgot what student groups are, is it's a way for me to organize my students in uh, different categories, or it's a way for me to organize students so that they can work together. And that's typically how teachers use it. But I also use student groups, even if I never have any intention of these students in the group working on a group assignment. Here's what I mean by that. You could see that one of my groups is labeled multilingual students. In my classroom, I would quite frequently have my multilingual students work together, but I almost never had all of my multilingual students work together because I had a lot of them. So that would be an obscenely large group, but I would still have a quote unquote group in Canvas with all of my multilingual students because then what I can do is I can go to this filter and hit multilingual students. And now Canvas is going to show me a list of all of the kids that I've put in that group and all of their grades. And then I can even stack additional filters on top of that. And I could say, you know what? I want all of my multilingual students. And I also want to see all of the missing assignments for all of my multilingual students. And I can target those students really quickly now. Um, this becomes really helpful when we're dealing with big groups of students who maybe all have an IEP or all have a 504, or maybe you're assigned a group of students that you are in charge of tracking their progress. You can put them into groups so that you can filter them in your gradebook really quickly. Again, when I was in the classroom, one of my groups oftentimes would just say, I I didn't even have a really good title for it, but it was usually like students I'm worried about, right? And I would just drop students into that group as I became worried about them, or if they had progressed, I'd move them out of the group. But then at any given time, I can go to my gradebook and it will just pull up a list of all the kids that I've told Canvas that I'm worried about, and it will show me their grades in my course. It will show me what they're missing, and I can filter down to anything that I need. So the point here is that today we've been talking about differentiation and personalization. I think one of the really powerful ways to do that though is to then monitor that differentiation and personalization. And you could do that really easily by filtering here. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I wanna pause for just a second. What questions can I respond to here before I show you one last thing and we wrap up? Okay, perfect. I actually lied to you. I'm gonna show you two last things, but I promise it's gonna be really quick. Um, the first of those two things is that I just wanted to reiterate, I spent some time talking about those groups. I just wanted to point you in the right direction again, if you're interested in using them. Um, if you want to use groups, just go to the people tab and then under the people tab, you're gonna create a group set and then create a new group. Again, we've talked about this in previous sessions, so I won't go into any more depth than that, but I just wanted to remind you where you might find that.
The other thing that I want to show you, and I've done this at the beginning of sessions in the past, but because this is our last session, I want to kind of end on this note. The last thing that I'll say is that UEN just has a lot of resources available to you. And so I just want to cycle back to those because let's say that you start working in Canvas a little bit more, you start trying some of these things, and maybe you have some follow-up questions. A really good place to go is first off UEN.org. And then if you go to this professional development tab, I'd recommend that you look in two places. The first place is we have a page all about Canvas with a bunch of Canvas resources. So videos on how to set up mastery paths, videos on how to filter your gradebook, so on and so forth. Uh, but additionally, we also offer free online self-paced courses. And so you can enroll in those at any point and receive support that way and kind of work through the course to expand what you know. Or even if you don't want credit, even if you don't want to move through a whole course, you can still enroll in those and just grab all of our resources. And that's totally fine too. I will say that right now, our Canvas courses are kind of in flux because we are completely overhauling all of them to make sure that they're up to date and go into an appropriate amount of depth and things like that. So you will probably see some Canvas courses in there, but just know that by the beginning of the year, you should have four Canvas courses available to you. And by the beginning of the year, I mean January 1st, not the school year. Uh, so by January 1st, there should be like an entry level Canvas course, an intermediate Canvas course, um, uh, like middle high Canvas course, and then an extremely advanced Canvas course. And so whatever level you feel like you're at, you can jump in that course, grab resources, complete the course if you want to, things like that. So I just wanted to end on that point. Again, I also want to just give you my email address. My name is Brad. Braxton, my email address is just braxton at uen.org. If you have any follow-up questions, if you're working on something and want a little bit more support, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help you. That's one of the things that I enjoy most about my job is getting to talk to teachers about their classrooms. So you're not a bother at all, uh, but please feel free to reach out if you run into any problems. With all of that said, though, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. If you have any questions, please feel free to stay on the call. I'm happy to respond to those questions as needed. But at this point, I hope that you have a really good one.